One, two, three, four. Hello everyone and welcome to the Power of Music Thinking. My name is Christoph Zürn and this is the podcast for people with a musical heart and a wicked job. We're looking for stories, insights and tools from the big world of music to inspire leaders and followers to listen, tune, play and perform in whatever field you're operating. What is the use of standing still for 10 minutes? I was asking myself when I saw a post on social media. It was a double picture of a man with a mobile phone around his neck displaying some data and another picture showed the view he saw at that moment. I learned that he stood there for 10 minutes without any movement, listening to the sound that was already there. There were many pictures like this and I decided to get into contact. So, today we're in Oslo. We speak with Alexander Refsum Jensenius, a professor of music technology at the University of Oslo, a book author, a music researcher, and a researching musician working in the fields of embodied music cognition and new interfaces for musical expression. Alexander shares with us his experiences while performing and testing with artistic methods of embodied listening and how people experience music and sound. This goes from experiments with and without the conductor of a symphony orchestra to the sounds of our kitchen appliances. And we talk about his motion capture lab, where a person's exact location and micro movements can be detected while they hear different kinds of music and how the researchers can understand what moves them. And Alexander shares insights about the Norwegian Championship of Standstill, where until now thousands of people have participated and the winner is the person with the lowest average velocity on standing the stillest over some time. And Alexander explains the interplay of body and mind and he reveals some secrets on how to move people, for example, on the dance floor or to calm them down. It all has to do with our BPM, the average heartbeat of about 60 beats a minute. So, without too much ado, let's get into it. Hello, Alexander. Welcome to The Power of Music Thinking. Hello, nice to be here. This actually is something like I thought that they have invented the internet for many, many years or 20 or 30 years. So like I'm using it. So you go online, you see something, you get interested and then you get in, in contact with the person. And actually that's what happened. So I went on Mastodon and I don't know if people know what Mastodon is. It's like an, an, a new Twitter, um, but not from a billionaire to put it like this. Okay, more distributed and it's more from the from the people so i think like the internet was meant from the right from the beginning and i just i just saw what you did and i thought hey wow this is interesting your standing still project and before we talk about this and there's much more to 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 share um there's always a question i ask my uh, guests in the beginning and it's like what is the first sonic experience or album, or live performance that had an impact on you? Well, that's uh, it's a tricky question. Um, there are different... Uh, depends on the, the music or the sound. If you take the sound first, I I think the, the first sound I remember uh, was uh, the kind of the very acute silence of uh, Norwegian stave church uh my father was a um, uh, medieval architect or he was working on arch medieval architecture and um drawing uh, stave churches in norway we have uh, these are like from the medieval times a thousand years old so every summer we spent uh out at the stave church around uh, the country here in norway and uh as a child then going into a stave church uh has a very kind of different sound so uh, it's a very different soundscape 
um, because it's made of wood. So it's it's not the kind of the cathedral type of sound that you would expect uh, with a long reverberation, but it's really a very dampened type of sound. And uh, I I can't remember exactly how old I was, around three, four, I guess, um, just sitting and playing inside of the state church and with this kind of really dampened sound around me, which is very different from what you normally would experience. I mean, outside there is always kind of some kind of nature sounds and in other buildings, I mean, it's it's more made of concrete or, or other things, you will have kind of more reverberation. So that's, uh, I, I just still keep that kind of sensation with me of this kind of dampened wood, wooden and 1000 year old kind of soundscape um, so that's for the sounds mm. wow how big is the church like this so they are pretty small actually so uh, built of wood but they are um, in square meters a uh, hundred or so pretty small okay. uh, oh, small nice. wooden state churches mm. Oh, interesting. And also the, the link with medieval. So you, um, yeah, you, you might al already have some kind of music <laughs> from the, from, from the Middle Ages that, that you would imagine that would uh, have been played there. Was there music also in church? No, there, there was no music, uh, during that, in those, uh, those periods, um, played in, in those churches. Uh, so, so it was really just the kind of the, the silence or the so called silence of, of the churches that kind of, uh yeah still gave me a very kind of bodily experience and uh in many ways i mean uh thinking about it, it now kind of and also thinking about the research i'm doing now i mean it, it re definitely resonates right so it was the the start in standing still or or being in stillness so. and, and listening to environments you could say yeah yeah and and what would be the the, the link to music albums or performances well, um, in terms of, of uh, albums and performances of this, I mean, much later, uh, I was very heavily inspired by by John Cage's 433, which is a, a well-known piece uh, uh, where uh, the pianist originally uh, walked on stage and sat down at the piano, opened the score and um, and basically just sat there without playing anything and uh, then turned the sheet and then continued to sit there and then after four minutes and 33 seconds would uh, rise up take the score and walk out so that's the whole performance and uh i i uh, i i heard and, and saw this this as a performance uh, when i began my studies um around 19 20 years old and uh it was very powerful for me then i mean this is a this is a piece that I that many people have heard about. Uh, not that many have actually seen it in performance, and I I saw it performed before I actually uh, had heard about it. Uh, so it was a very interesting experience because uh, the idea is that you will listen to the so-called silence of the space, but as you're sitting there, you realize that there is so much going on. Uh, both in the space itself and uh, also around with people and being around doing all sorts of uh, sounds etc but uh, this kind of so-called background sounds are are not really foregrounded normally because we just think about them as being there it's it's, it's really the background and i guess the the point of john cage was really to foreground it and and really have people pay attention to what's going on around us absolutely there's an Let's say nowadays we would say mindfulness aspect uh, in, in it to realize what's already there, and uh, and also that you realize that there are sounds that are very far, like a plane flying over that you that your brain just had mm. <laughs> erased because the brain said, "Oh, that's not interesting," or if, if you're alone. And actually, I thought about this when you when you said uh, you were in church, you you also hear your body noise, mm -hmm. uh, your your breath sure. or, or uh, anything else. So it's really like unites you with everything that's uh, audible. Beautiful. I, I did this once uh, with a conference with 120 people. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do the piano version. We did it with a choir. So mm -hmm. we, I think it was eight people standing there. And there was the, the get going uh, signal. And also because it's a three-part piece, so you have to do you need two two more uh, signals, 
and without telling the audience what it is. So that was really like people first, they were, yeah, they have their question mark. Then they try to understand, is there a noise? And then they later, they realize, oh, it's about us. So it was really like a um, really nice, great piece. Thank you for, for sharing this. Um, Alexander, will you tell a little bit about you, yourself, what you're doing uh, right now? And then we can uh, segue into the Standing Still project sure. that uh, brought us together. Yeah, no, so so I'm a professor of music technology at the University of Oslo. And um, uh, many people wonder what a music technologist uh, actually does. And um, the, the short answer to that, I guess, is that um, music technology, as I see it, is as a field, as a discipline, is the combination of the the techne and the logos. So it's about the tools and how we do things, uh, make music, analyze music, uh, etc. But also the thinking, the logos, the the knowledge that we gain through this and uh, with this and and uh, for this. So so music technology as a discipline involves then both the the making of different types of machinery and uh, and analysis techniques and the uh, programming code and whatnot involved in in all sorts of, of musicking uh, but it also involves the kind of more fundamental research questions underlying this which ties into more general information theory but also a lot of uh, music psychology and cognition I mean how do we experience the world etc because for example if you want to capture sound, with a microphone and a sound card, you need to know a lot about what sound is, uh, how it uh, is generated, produced in the first place, how it uh, works in an environment in the terms of the acoustics, how it can be uh, recorded and filtered, etc. Um, and also then processed uh, as, as well uh, later on. So so um, that's what I'm, I'm kind of uh, teaching as a professor. And um, in terms of my research, I've been. Uh, I started out doing more, perhaps traditional music technology, you could say, in terms of recording and um, composing, producing, and performing. Uh, now I kind of zoomed more in on what I call embodied music technology, where I am interested in in the body, the human body, and how the human body responds to music and musical sound. And also how we can use the human body to produce musical sounds in novel ways. So uh, I call myself both a music researcher and a research musician because I also like to then, uh, I do more traditional scientific things in in my in our lab with students doing experiments and, and these things. But I also perform and uh, test how I can use more artistic uh, methods to gain new insight about uh, music as well. And again, using different types of computer systems and, and these things. Nice. And as a sort of self um, experiment, you started the uh, standing still. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit uh, about this? How, how did you come to the idea? But, you know, if if I think back to your first sonic experience, so it's not so far away from it, isn't it? Well, I mean, thinking back at it, it, it makes sense. But I mean, there were uh, a few decades in between there where, where I didn't really think much about standing still. In fact, I... Um, I worked. Uh, I started working more with dancers because I was interested in in the human body. So, I uh, in the early two thousands, I, I created various types of interactive uh, music systems for dance. Basically, where the dancer could walk on stage and um, through various types of uh, sensing uh, cameras, etc., would uh, be able to create music on the fly. So they would make, basically instead of dancing to music, they would create music while dancing um, be, as kind of becoming more like a musician in a way. So I worked then with the relatively large scale body motion in terms of dancers moving on a stage. We also took this into the lab, looking more at how we could uh, look at people's body motion and understand more about how they uh, how they process musical sound. So we did a series of studies where people were coming into the lab, we played music to them and asked them to move basically the music mm. either to to tap along, to nod their heads, uh, to dance, to conduct, to trace the sounds in the in the air, etc. And what kinds it, of music uh, did you any use? Any type of music, really. I mean, we have been testing many different things, uh, and the the idea has really been to tease out how do people actually experience music because we are very bad at talking about our experiences. 
um, but by looking at what people do, uh, mm. we understand more about what they pay attention to. So we did a lot of these studies and I eventually also got more into the field of motion capture, which is uh, what people typically use in to create animation movies and, and these things. And we have a motion capture lab now at uh, here at my century. And uh, the idea there is that you can get a very detailed and uh, rendition of, of how you move in, in space. And then one day, uh, back in 2010, I, I worked with a dancer in the in the space and I said that, well, this system is very, very good. I mean, it can record motion with a millimeter accuracy. And she looked at me and asked, really? Are you sure? And uh, I, this was just a saying. I had actually hadn't tested it. So I said, well, let's try. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, we put on the mocap suits and, and we said, well, let's stand here for, say, 10 minutes. Uh, maybe you have to explain the the suits so, so the suit yeah so the suit is is more uh, it's more like a kind of sports looking thing where you have this uh, reflective markers that you put on the body and then you have cameras around you and then uh, through through the cameras you are able then to capture the 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 exact location of these these markers in the space wow. so that's uh, so you get this kind of skeleton model out of, of where you are and with it and the kind of a millimeter precision of where you are in the in the space so to see all these micro movement that uh, also because a, a body can't stand still exactly so that's the thing right but we but we hadn't ex- looked at that at all because i've been looking at large scale motion i mean the dancer moving around the space etc but then we decided okay let's stand here for 10 minutes uh, without moving and uh, what we found was extremely fascinating we got this very noisy signal but indeed the system is able to capture this and we looked at the signal, which uh, if you plot it, it looks more or less like noise in a way. Uh, so it's kind of the noise of the body. But then when you zoom in, you see that there are certain things happening in that signal. You have a uh, kind of a slightly longer kind of curves that feel some, somehow similar to the respiration. I mean, our breathing mm-hmm. patterns. This system is so detailed that it can even pick up the pulse of the heart. The heart rate can also even be seen in this data, showing up as spikes. And then every two to three minutes, there were also these spikes uh, in the signal kind of uh, that I didn't really know about at the time, but that this is kind of like a postural adjustment that everyone does uh, uh, once in a while. Ah, these micro movements that you... Exactly. Yeah. So so that's kind of when I began, kind of became really interested in, okay, there is something here. There is something in this noise. Uh-huh. There is a signal here. And I became curious about, okay, what, what is actually going on in a body standing still? And then, of course, as a music researcher, I'm also interested in, okay, what if I play music to people then? What happens then? Mm. But will it change the way you move? Oh, that's interesting. But... but um... How, how did it work? So people came in, get get the suit. You have the, your your camera or or, or what else uh, kind of equipment, and then you ask them to stand still for let's say ten minutes or even longer, yep. and then you play different so different kinds of musics. Yes, yeah, that's the idea. So uh, play music of yeah around half a minute or so. I mean, not too long, not too short. Uh, we have over the years now, since 2010, I've I've organized the Norwegian Championship of Standstill to have more people to come into the lab to do this. So it's kind of been a competitive <laughs> element as well. And uh, we've oh, been hang, hang on, types this of means people. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, what does it mean? Does it mean that the championship is who can't stand? Who can uh, stand at still store? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So the winner uh, is the person with the the lowest uh, kind of uh, average velocity, the one standing the stillest over time. But they have to stay, not sit, because a yogi, for example, would would be in the Champions League of your <laughs> yeah. No, you, <laughs> of your need competition. To, you need to stand straight up and down on the floor for ten minutes, and then uh, yeah, we're playing these different uh, musical excerpts, also with silence in between, so that we have like have a control. And uh, yeah, and then uh, the person that's able to stand the stillest wins the the championship. Well, that's nice. So um, all the listeners that think, oh, that's interesting, and I don't know how it works, they can do it by themselves, isn't it? So just stay together or distribute it in a room and uh, get a DJ with 30 seconds (laughs) sound files. 
Exactly. Or longer, if you like. Uh, and the interesting thing was that when I started researching this, uh, well, everybody or many people say that, well, music moves you. Uh, that's been a saying, but nobody had actually done any empirical research on this. It's just been kind of uh, anecdotal that, that music moves us. Uh, so I kind of set out then to really check whether music actually moves people and if we can have find empirical evidence for that. Were there any, let's say, surprising results where you thought, um, yeah, like you'd say, if you get a, a punk uh, piece, where you, would everybody after thirty seconds be a headbanger, or what can I uh, yeah. imagine? Yeah, no. The interesting thing is that we now we've done this many times, and I've had uh, almost a thousand people participating in the championship, um, so we have a lot of data, and uh, we do see that dance music does indeed make people move uh, a little bit more than other types of music. So that's good for everyone producing and making dance music. But not any type of dance music even. So it's particularly music with a beat per minute rate of a little bit faster than 120 BPM. Mm. Um, so that's interesting as well, because there have been other studies showing that the human body has a resonant frequency in everyday actions at around 2 hertz, which is the same as 120 BPM. So a lot of dance music, if you look at the, I mean, there are other people who have been uh, calculating the average of typical dance music, and the average is around 128 BPM. And that's interesting because it's a little bit faster than the typical comfortable kind of, uh, uh, kind of frequency range that we are moving in when we're just walking, for example. And if you ask people to clap, uh, they would typically clap at 120 BPM. Also, marching is at 120 BPM, etc. So we believe that exactly because dance music is a little bit faster than kind of our natural frequency, that's what kind of gives us the urge to move in a way. Ah, okay. uh, so that's kind of it's a little bit tweaking it a little bit because we also tested it. If you go up to 140 BPM, for example, it doesn't work that way necessarily. And also if you go below, uh, it doesn't work either. So it's particularly around the, that range. It's particularly kind of moving in a way. But also there needs to be a certain level of complexity in music, but not too complex either. So we tested this with also very simple kind of metronome, simple beats. Yeah. Uh, that does not work so well. If you have too complex, like experimental jazz, that doesn't work too well either. But kind of medium complex uh, dance music uh, with some syncopation, kind of a little bit off, um, typically what you would find on the dance floor, does actually indeed work. Oh, and, and um, does the sound of the instrument has an influence or is it just the beat, the rhythm? Uh, well, we haven't, uh, there, there are so many variables here. So we haven't systematically tested the effect of instrumentation, but we have looked at um, some changes in the frequency range. So in, in electronic dance music, there is uh, something called uh, uh, kind of the break routine which is something that happens after you have a regular beat for a while. Then you come to a point in the song where everything, the, the typically the, the beat will stop and everything will dissolve a little bit. And, and there you'll also often see that the frequency range will go, go down. So you would kind of have more like a bass-like type of sounds, followed by an increase in both frequency and tempo. And then you go back to the what we call the drop, where you kind of drop back into the groove again. And this you find in very many dance tracks, you find this thing that it happens kind of uh, uh, out in the piece and it's kind of a way of exciting people. Hmm. And so that's you had, there you also have like an instrumentation frequency component to this as well. And with frequency, and, we have to explain to people that are not in in our language. So it's the, the yeah, so higher the, it's sounds kind of the and lower Yeah, sounds. it's the brightness of the sound in a way. You can say the brightness goes up uh, there as part of this drop. And uh, and that excites people as well. So we see an, an impact of that as well. Sounds interesting. And interesting in the way that um certain musicians know this because they see the effect that people dancing to certain to a certain way so it's not mm. like scientific mm. and then you you make scientific music for example because if you research th this and you explain it like that this could be let's say an instruction for um, a dj or or a music band to influence the movements of the people sure 
Yeah, so this is, um, I mean, uh, some of our findings are quite uh, make sense, I think, from for composers and producers and etc. that that know these things, but uh, perhaps don't know why it happens. So, I mean, as uh, mm. researchers, we also try to explain why this happens and kind of also name it. And um, also, again, as a music technologist, I'm interested in also how it's possible to do these things interactively so that we can create systems that can, for example, adjust to a group of, of people dancing and then automatically uh, make better music in a way, in the sense that it will adjust to the people that is listening to it and can adjust to their tempo and then increase and help them, for example, to move more. Uh, that could be in a dance context. Or if you're running, for example, it can, the music can also adjust to you and help and push you to run a little bit faster, for example, based on the kind of the, the, the rhythm and the tempo that you're in. Hmm. So there's, in that sense, also linked to, let's say, sound healing or, or, or yeah, let's say, mind hacks we we had in one of the earlier podcasts to to influence uh, us with, uh, w w yeah, with the music. For example, now we talk about movement, and mm -hmm. this, if I get it right, if 120 is the bass and you make it uh, the, the baseline and you make it quicker, people have the urge to also. Uh, adapt <laughs> um, but if you would do it less like 80 uh, mm. bpm so uh, would then people slow down and would be a little bit more quiet yeah that's the that's a good question and um we haven't uh we have started researching this but we are we have, we have much more to do uh here we it's not as simple as that uh unfortunately perhaps you could say um We tested different types of music and, for example, we found that typical meditation music, which you would perhaps believe would calm people down, doesn't necessarily do so. I mean, because and right now, the, our reasoning there is that if you have very kind of droney, swooshy type of music, uh, it's also a bit unstable. Uh, so it kind of doesn't help and guide you. Mm. Um so in fact, uh, very boring pop music, 4-4 four, four pop music, uh, actually makes people move less than, for example, uh, meditation music, which is interesting and perhaps a bit counterintuitive. So, But this is something we are now looking more into as well and try to figure out, okay, what does it actually take to physically move or uh, or, or make people move less? And also, ideally, since we also work from a what we call an embodied cognition paradigm, the idea is that also the body and mind works closely together, so that uh, it, it's really impossible to separate them properly. And that also means that if you calm down the body, you will also calm down the mind, and and vice versa. Uh, but uh, so far, I mean, there is there are still many open questions in in this research. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking. Thinking out loud, there there is the 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 rhythm uh, thing, or what you just said. If 120 is the baseline, you do it to 128, and then they move, but they don't do when it's 140, for example. You, you mm. just mentioned, and the other way around is it's the same. So if you go from 120, maybe I'm just making up to 110. This would maybe have a more calming effect than going to 80 or 70. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that makes sense. Uh, and this is the type of things we're now kind of continuing with in our yeah. We do this championship once a year, and then we have a new hypothesis each year. So we kind of well, it takes time to to do research like this. But uh, on the other hand, there are so many interesting questions really that we're trying to deal with, and and ultimately also to really try to have to also have the to get the empirical evidence to support this these theories. Right. Oh, it, um, I, I just heard a story about um, if you have to reanimate a person, you have to do it in a certain rhythm and a certain beat. And someone told me that uh, staying alive, you know, ha, ha, mm -hmm. ha, ha, staying alive, that mm -hmm. this would be the right beat. But I think it's less than 120, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure about that one, actually. I haven't checked. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's just uh, something I heard and maybe interesting. So because people told me, okay, when I when you have to reanimate, how quick? So if you're maybe stressed by yourself, you might do it too quick. Uh, on, so yeah. this was something, okay, if you have this song in your mind, staying alive, and this was, <laughs> yeah, sounds like a pun, but <laughs> it, might, it, it might save lives. Yeah. No, that's a good point. 
You you told me that you be, be before our talk you just uh, did your stand uh, still. What is it? Moment ritual? How do you call it? Yeah. So now this um, this year I'm I'm working on writing up a, a book called Still Standing based on uh, all my research into into standing still and. Um, As part of that research, I decided to test it on myself. Uh, so I have made this ritual now where every day I'm standing still for 10 minutes. And uh, and the idea here is that I will uh, then also collect data uh, on myself uh, and have 365 different recordings to also understand more about the differences uh, over time. Uh, because some people have asked me... Uh, Do you improve, for example, over time? And uh, also, does it matter when during the day you stand still and what you have eaten and uh, all sorts of different things? So that's why I'm curious about them. Well, testing on myself, it's a, it's a small kind of empirical data set in that sense, but uh, it's, it's long in the sense that I have many recordings on myself. So I'm kind of exploring this now, um, kind of my individual differences from day to day of, of standing still. So that's kind of one part of, of that project. But the other part of the project is related to a new research project I've started up, uh, which looks at the impact of the environment on on our lives, the background. So this is back to the kind of the to the what we started talking about, where what is the background and uh, of our lives and how does it impact us? So every day I'm standing still in a new uh, room. I decided to only work in indoor environments for simplicity's sake. Uh, so I, I find a, a room and uh, I set up my my video recorder and audio recorder and also capture my own uh, respiration and motion. How do you and do I this? I stand still for, for 10 minutes. Oh, and, and, and what's your equipment? Can, could everybody do this? Everybody could do this. I'm using a normal, well, it's a GoPro camera, uh, 360 camera. So I, because I want to capture the whole the whole space, uh -huh. and I use uh, also a commercial. Uh, it's an Ambisonics microphone. It's a particular microphone with four capsules, so that it captures the the 360 degree kind of surround sound of the of the room. So also uh, everything that's behind you. So every so you really like like you hear like you stand. It's not li like stereo what we hear now, no. but it's like really everything also exactly. sounds behind you. Yeah, that's the idea to capture the whole the whole space. And the idea here is then uh, that I now will get also these recordings from one new uh, room every day. So I will have 365 of these when I'm done. And then I will look at, uh, well, my standstill and there's a lot of, of data there and look at the correlation to the space I'm in. And uh, also for the ambient project, I will also look at the, uh, the audio and video separately, independent of my standstill, just to get an idea of, of well, basically the environments that I'm in. Can, can we hear what you what you just heard when you stood still the sure. yeah, four so... minutes before? So uh, I have I have some examples here of, of and this is from standing still in a technical corridor uh, below my office at the university. Uh, one of the tricky things also about doing this thing is, and since I need a new room every day, I need to really explore the buildings I'm in uh, to find new spaces. <laughs> uh, this is number 250. Uh, so I've been standing in many spaces at the university, but of course also other places. So. I have uh, I have this recording where uh, in the beginning of this recording, uh, in this technical room, uh, it was a quite loud ventilation noise from the ventilation system of the building, and uh, it's qu it's quite fascinating. I mean, we can listen to uh, short excerpts of, of, of this because, uh, and I didn't know when I started that it would stop, but it did stop. Uh, but it stopped in a very musical way. So I have an excerpt here, which is around 20 seconds long or something, where which is a few minutes into the, the recording, but where you hear this ventilation, ventilation noise and um, yeah, and then it stops.
So that's uh, that's kind of uh, this transition thing. And the, the fascinating thing about this um, is uh, now I'm particularly attuned to to listening to noise, uh, both uh, <laughs> yeah. both from my kind of also experimental music background, but also from from listening to these type of things. But the the noise, uh, the fan was also increasing in speed. Yeah. Was accelerating, so yeah. You had like a tempo increase, but also a frequency, and the pitch kind of also went up a little bit. Uh, quite musical in a sense, and then you get this got this drop. Yeah. Uh, can we can we hear it again? Only that part, so that everybody doesn't. So it's it's that let's say some kind of boring sound, and then it accelerates a little bit, gets higher, and then yep. it's. Vroom. Let's try again. Beautiful. So I, I just found it to be a very interesting and very musical kind of quality to the sound. And that was totally unexpected. And uh, no, usually people wouldn't think about this as, at all. The interesting thing, though, is that now I was standing down in the technical room where this was very present. Um, of course, I have the same ventilation system here in my office. And uh, it's quite annoying, actually, it's sitting up here. It's probably filtered out on, the, on this recording. But um, that also in inspired me that... There is so much noise around us all the time, sonic noise, uh, particularly from ventilation systems, but also from other types of fans that we have around. It can be a projector. Uh, actually, last weekend I was in a in a cabin out in the forest, a really beautiful silent space, and uh, I, I was standing still inside of this cabin. And most people would think that this is a super cozy and and uh, quiet environment. But this, there was this refrigerator there uh, making a horrible noise. So it was this extremely this absurd experience of standing in the middle of the, the forest, watching the, the trees outside and listening to a few birds singing here and there and generally the quietness of everything. But the hum and the kind of high-pitched, unpleasant hum of a fridge standing there next to me. So, so it's kind of all these things that that now I, I'm as I'm becoming more and more interested in the background of our lives, I notice these things and I, I try to to think about well, perhaps you should actually pay more attention to these backgrounds and kind of think about uh, well, it's not nice to get fresh air into a room, but it's also the the sonic qualities of that and the aesthetics of that and the the impact it has on us. I think we haven't discussed enough um, in our in our societies now because at least here in Norway, all modern buildings have ventilation systems these days, and many of them are quite noisy. But also, we have projectors, we have fridges, we have computers with fans. We have, I mean, it's a, basically everywhere you go, there is some kind of no, noise, gen, electric noise uh, of some kind. And um, right, it's a but, it's a drone. It's a drone in different frequencies, and exactly. uh, and you don't know how they add up, and maybe give you an interference frequency that is maybe not healthy for you. Exactly. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that it's necessarily unhealthy. I mean, sometimes it can be can be pleasant. I mean, this in the sound example I played now, I think is quite pleasant. But I I don't think uh, people think enough about kind of how that impacts us and uh, our lives and our bodies and minds. And that's also when you buy a new fridge, for example, they will tell you how cold it might be. <laughs> yeah. And they might tell you how many um, uh, electricity it needs, mm. which already, I don't know if they, if every, every fridge is do, uh, doing it, but they never give you the sound, what kind of sound it will. Uh, sometimes produce. you can ask for the, and look at the, they, sometimes you can get the kind of the, the loudness of it, the decibel measurement, but still the decibel measurement is, quite different from the actual sound because you can have a low decibel but you can have a very unpleasant uh still from an aesthetic point of view uh unpleasant sound right i'm just uh, have a look i think it's called quiet mic that um, so, um there's there is an organization that collect all the information uh, about uh, let's say modern electronics 
and um, and measure how um, how loud they are and what frequencies. I, I will put it in the show notes when I when I um, get um, uh, when I, f- I find it. Thank yeah. you. That's a, a very very interesting. You also told me uh, when we talked before about a project you did at the Norwegian Broadcasting. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? And it was about the, the with with or without conducting so there was an experiment that you did with them yeah so this is uh this is an experiment we are actually planning now uh with the norwegian uh, radio orchestra um and the idea here is that we we want to look at uh how the musicians in an orchestra uh how they move and how they uh, their bodies uh, respond in a, a musical setting so we've we've done we started to do some experiments with another orchestra, Stavanger Symphony Orchestra, um, uh, where we that was more of an exploratory study where we equipped all the uh, musicians with uh, a belt that measures their uh, respiration, their breathing, but also their heart rate and uh, their motion, how they move. And uh, so we kind of we know that we're able to do this now, uh, which is a massive undertaking when you have like 70 musicians on stage and yeah. actually trying to capture all of them in a setting like this. So now we are doing a more uh, controlled study with the, the Norwegian Radio Orchestra, where we are looking specifically at uh, then how they will respond with and without a conductor. And the interesting thing here is that when musicians play in smaller groups and ensembles, they don't typically use a conductor, if you have a quartet or an octet even. Um, uh, because then, and then you, the musicians rely on watching each other and listening to each other. And this we have studied uh, quite a bit in the past uh, with uh, looking at uh, different string quartets. So we, we've uh, done ex- an experiment with the Danish uh, string quartet uh, a project called Music Lab Copenhagen, which was done right after Corona. So it was the first concert they did after Corona. Uh, so that was exciting on its own because people were certain, I mean, finally you can go back to a concert hall, which was an amazing experience, I had to say, for both for the musicians and for the audiences and saying that live music is not the same as uh, as mediated music. Um, but there we also looked at, at the musicians and used similar technologies to measure their heart rates and respiration and also we looked at how and where they look and we found many interesting things um, including also that uh, the musicians have particular patterns for looking at each other and also listening to each other and tuning to each other and in fact even with the Danish string quartet we even found that they they actually synchronized their heartbeats uh, while while playing which is quite incredible really uh, thinking about it but that's showing how can kind of tuned they are to each other and we're doing more research to try to understand exactly why and how that happens. But now we're scaling this up to look at an entire orchestra, which is a totally different thing. And of course, when you have, say, 70 musicians on stage that will do something together, uh, so they're both together and need to follow the score and and be precise in every single way. But they're also doing different things, right? So uh, each musician, or perhaps not each musician, but at least each group are playing different things. Uh, so there are many, many things going on at the same time. And still they manage to kind of synchronize in the line and hit the right kind of beats, etc., which is quite incredible, really, when you think about the complexity of what's going on. And that's why you need a conductor, typically, to help with aligning and help with telling the musicians you should come in here and there and then keeping track of the tempo, etc. But then there are orchestras are interested in exploring how we can do this without the conductor and uh, now we're trying to going to try to see how this works playing the same piece with and without the conductor and measuring what's happening then with the musicians as well how they approach it how it impacts the music etc so it's uh, that's it's it's really fascinating and and also again trying to i mean we have our hypothesis but also then trying to gather empirical evidence for that support uh, this hypothesis will be an important uh, thing as you move forward what's the hypothesis well i mean there there are uh, for one thing uh, playing without a conductor uh, we assume that the musicians will need to be more attentive they will, to put it uh, in a metaphorical sense, they will need to sit more on the tip of their chair and uh, and follow uh, and what's going on. They need to kind of look around and listen more attentively to 
to to the others. Uh, we are particularly interested in seeing how the instrument groups behave, because uh, if you're playing in a violin section and you're playing the same as your neighbors, of course, then you will relate more to your neighbors. I mean, and you will follow along there. But how will, if we sample, uh, attend to what they do in the, the woodwinds, uh, which is a different group playing something else? And uh, it's this kind of multi-processing of information, both kind of locally, kind of something similar to what you're doing yourself, but also thinking about other groups and also the holistic of the um, the orchestra that uh, we are very, very curious to to see. And we will we expect to find that the musicians will be perhaps less precise in a way, mm. uh, if you want to measure it mathematically. But we also believe that the music may be more interesting, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately, because it's less precise. And it's, it's this human thing about... Um, it's the same thing with, with if you think about just rhythm, which is only one part of music, but uh, but an important part. is that we as humans, we, we like repetition, but we also like variation. So at, at my research center called Ritmo, we study rhythm in different ways. And uh, here the kind of the, the general thing we're interested in is exactly to look at this the repetition and variation and how you need uh, some, a certain level of, of repetition for it to be a rhythm, but you also need a certain level of variation to make it interesting. So uh, we don't really like to listen to like plain metronome, for example. It's just... Mm -hmm quickly becomes boring uh, but we don't really like to listen to pure noise either so it's something in between and it's finding that balance that that we find interesting what what's that right balance uh, that's that's beautiful and that's also the analogy in the power of music thinking we are not necessarily only focused on music then it would be the power of music but in the power of music thing it's like okay what what is music doing or is there something in music that we can learn from and if you if you use this example for an organization a company with 60 or 70 people in different sections in different units and how they uh, synchronize them themselves um, a few episodes before we had uh, Harvey Seifter and he was the CEO of the Orpheus Jambo Orchestra and you might you might know them there since 50 50 years they're doing nothing else than uh, playing without um, a conductor they even don't rehearse with a conductor and there was one trick that he uh, he, uh, he shared with us or one trick um, everybody had the full score at least for the rehearsals to see what happens somewhere else when i'm doing this And uh, I think that that might be also an interesting part. So it's not only about you or your group; it's your group in relation to to all the others. When we talk about the symphony, yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. And and one of the underlying theoretical models that we are building on here is of what we call entrainment, which is an old physics principle, but where the idea is that uh, when you have two or more uh, systems with a, some kind of period, periodic pattern uh, or oscillating systems, as you, as you can call them, uh, they will influence each other and they will kind of drag each other to synchrony. And this is something you can observe also if you walk on the street with uh, someone you know, you will typically entrain to the other's walking pattern. So you will see that you will, or if you are running and in, uh, in, uh, doing a, Uh, running together with others, you will see that you typically synchronize your footsteps. And and this is uh, through entrainment processes where you kind of drag each other into kind of uh, synchrony. The opposite is also true. If you walk uh, on the street and there's a, a stranger in front of you, you might try to explicitly not entrain to that person's uh, footsteps because it may be a bit kind of sneaky uh, kind of to, to entrain with someone else. <laughs> so this we do con and, and consciously all the time. And uh, of course, in more complex settings, uh, like an orchestra or even an organization, I guess you entrain to others. I mean, that's how we that's how we live in the world. I mean, we entrain all the time to things around us. Also, when when you speak to 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 other people, they will start nodding with you, and you will you will gesticulate, and all these things are also based on the same principles. And we are very interested in kind of understanding the underlying mechanisms of this entrainment processes, how they work. 
And again, also from a music technology perspective, I'm very interested in also seeing how can we model this with computers and how can we also make, for example, computer sounds and music that entrain to people in various ways. Yeah, absolutely. That getting together, coming together, it's like when you ask 100 people to clap, at the very end, they will clap in, in some kind of unison. Sure. And that's so, fascinating so, too. I mean, it's it's amazing how people are able to do these things. I mean, uh, to have, I mean, or even thousands of people can clap uh, in synchrony uh, without really any training. It's a very deeply rooted kind of human, uh, human uh, possible uh, kind of way, way of behaving, you could say. Wow. So there's a lot to to explore and there's a lot to to do and a lot to share. So Alexander, thank you. Is there anything that you want to share that we didn't touch? No, I think we talked about a lot. <laughs> right. So then thank you very much. I will also put the, in the show notes uh, links like how, uh, how to reach you, how to get more information about your project. And thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate this because listening is one of the top leadership skills and I feel honored about this. It is my mission to find, create and share inspirations for meaningful collaboration based on music analogies. If you want to support this, please subscribe to the podcast, give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Spotify. And more inspirations can be found on musicthinking.com. We have a blog and you can download the Music Thinking Framework. And finally, I would love to hear your feedback. And if you need help with a business challenge, please reach out to me via email podcast at musicthinking.com.